Uh, and what we're going to be talking about uh, is uh, tips and tricks uh, for, for design life. Uh, we've got probably a dozen or so in here. I'm going to go through the first, uh, uh, the first half, and then, and then Jimmy's going to follow it up. Um, <coughs> to just to introduce her a little bit more, Bindu uh, is based here in Detroit. She is a, uh, an application engineer as well. Uh, many of you have probably talked to her. If you guys are based around here, I'm sure the vast majority of you have, uh, have spoken with Bindu at some point. Uh, okay, so... <coughs> With, uh, without any sort of real introduction to anything, we're just going to kind of throw slides up on here, uh, and I will we'll just kind of talk to them. Um, the, the first one we're going to bring up, and by the way, th they're, in, they're in absolutely no order whatsoever. Um, yeah, yeah, they're, they're all equally as, as helpful and uh, tipful, if that's a word. So static entity subsets. Um, this, this is a, a feature that allows you to specify uh, some set of nodes or elements to either be used or excluded uh, in your analysis. Um, there are a number of different ways that you can define them. Um, if you go look in your uh, static entity subset, uh, the, the options that you have there, you will see your entity source. You get to choose whether it's uh, from IDs, from a user set file, or from, uh, from multi-column uh, input. This is typically used um, to either exclude or include uh, areas of interest. So uh, if you think of a, a normal analysis, uh, normally you'll just kind of do the whole model, maybe at a high level, uh, maybe a stress filter or something like that, uh, and then a damage calculation and so forth. Um, and th this would be used in a case where you absolutely know you don't need those elements. So if you have a particularly uh, nasty area, something that's not modeled, uh, properly, but you don't really care, um, and you know you don't want those in the model, you can just throw them out at the, at the beginning. Or conversely, um, you can uh, include them right away. Okay, so that's static entity subsets there. Um, what's up next? Okay, load mapping validation. Uh, this is a feature uh, that allows you well, it doesn't allow you, it automatically checks for you whether or not the number of load cases and number of channels, if you're running a time series analysis, match up. Um, this option right here, uh, validate auto configure loading, um, is, is where you'll find this. Um, by I think the default is warn. Uh, it will give you a warning if you have more channels than you have load cases. If you have more load cases than channels, obviously it, at that point it has to error out because it doesn't know what to do. If you have, if you have three load cases and you're only sending it two channels, uh, this auto configure right here will have an empty load case with, with nothing to do with it. So it'll uh, throw an error and um, won't let you uh, run the analysis. If you leave it to warn, uh, then it'll just let you know that, uh, that something's that something's amiss, um, but if you do have more load cases uh, than channels, it will always err regardless of what you put here. Okay. <coughs> uh, along the same lines uh, is something called uh, validate uh, material mapping, uh, and this will do a similar sort of thing for your materials. Uh, it'll run through and make sure that you have uh, material signed to all of your elements. Okay, if you don't have uh, something assigned to the default material, and you have a bunch of other, say, material groups here, and you've assigned a handful of them, uh, but you're missing some, it will uh, check before the run. This way, your uh, uh, you get a, a warning right up front that uh, that lets you know you've uh, forgotten to assign something. Right, instead of uh, yeah. 45 hours, apparently, after you uh, start your run. <coughs> That's a big model. Um, so I th I by default, I believe that's checked. Is that true? By default, that's going to be on? OK. OK. So uh, apparently, it's, it is not uh, active by default. So you'll probably want to make use of that. It, it's quite handy if you're dealing with large models. Um, 
<coughs> if you are using a duty cycle and you have a whole series of events here, okay, uh, this is only this example only goes through three, but you can imagine uh, very quickly having uh, hundreds or so down here. Um, you can actually copy uh, and paste these event properties from one event onto the others. Uh, this is a very uh, easy way uh, to kind of propagate this information in one and, and repeat it all the way uh, throughout the rest of them. Uh, so, for example, if you go look at one of your um, uh, one of your loads here, uh, you say you go in and edit the properties, and you say you have a divider of 1,000, uh, and you apply that to your uh, two of these load cases here. Okay, you can highlight this, uh, or just right-click in it rather, and hit duplicate setup. And the next screen you'll see, uh, or it'll give you a little thing here that says, okay, you had two more time series definitions. You can see them over here. And it uh, copied, wait, it's the next page. Sorry, it'll copy them to the rest of your definitions as well. So if you edit these, right click, um, uh, and uh, Duplicate. I th the option is called duplicate setup. It'll uh, copy those over to the rest of your the rest of your time series analyses, and this will only do it to the time series ones. Obviously, it can't copy anything over to a constant amplitude um, if you're if you're okay. Uh, pipe post processor combinations. This is uh, useful if you're running. Uh, multiple runs. Uh, you have an option here that's called run combination. And it gives you three options. Uh, worst, overwrite, and sum. Um, what this basically dictates is when you have multiple runs, what do you do when you have multiple results for, uh, for one node? Um, you want to take the worst of those, do you want to overwrite those, or do you want to sum them together? These uh, three bullet points kind of highlight the situations uh, in which you might use uh, one or the other. Uh, for example, the worst case uh, could be useful if you have uh, two different analysis settings. Say you're running uh, maybe a Smith-Watson topper and a Morrow, and you wanted to uh, run them both and take whichever was worst. Okay, uh, you select worst, and uh, and then it will spit out the uh, the, the most damaged value there. Overwrite would be useful if you are running two, uh, two separate analyses, say a filter run and a detailed run, <coughs> and uh, you want to obviously keep the last result as it will be the more detailed analysis. Uh, so you hit overwrite there, and uh, the end result will be the last run that, uh, that it analyzed. Some then, of course, will do exactly what you suspect. It will sum the two of them together. Uh, this is useful if you have uh, damage occurring from two different mechanisms. Here, uh, in this particular situation, we're looking at fatigue and, and creep. Okay, so you'll run a fatigue calculation uh, and a creep calculation, add those damages together uh, at the end. Okay. Uh, and synchronizing displays. Uh, this is useful if you have uh, quite a few displays on your screen uh, and you're zooming into one area on one and you want that view to propagate to all the other displays. Down in the very bottom corner here uh, of your FE input or your FE display, uh, you'll see this little button called Synchronize. Um, if you check it on one, you have to then go check it on all the other ones that you want to synchronize as well. Then anytime you open up one of those uh, displays, be it the FE input uh, or the FE display, if you move either one of them, the other one will move as well. Uh, this works for pan, zoom, uh, rotate, whatever orientation uh, you set the uh, whatever model you're looking at in, the other one uh, will follow suit. Okay, uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Bindu. Far more exciting than me. Can you hear me? All right. So thank you, Joe.
Um, when we'd envision, Joe and I put our heads together to make this tips and tricks, uh, we'd envision it be more fun if we did a tag team, so here goes. Um, the next one is, so this is just a listing of all the um, questions we usually get on the support hotline. Um, and one of the things that normally comes up for doing hypermesh output, especially if you had a model where you were doing unaverage nodal calculations, um, there is a new property in the FE output list that writes out hypermesh files, and that's called node and element compression. And what that does is basically restrict the column the first column that we write out to the hypermesh file. Um, if you are doing seam weld analysis, this is particularly important because we tend to write out node per element as a result, and uh, hypermesh didn't like that a whole lot. So um, we've actually put in a property called node and element compression, and depending on what this is set to, um, it would only write out element or node data followed by dynamic value. Okay, moving on. Um, so John talked about in his presentation about smart ways to speed up a fatigue calculation. There is a wizard actually in design life that lets you add filter runs for damage and stresses. So you can very easily take a, a, a large body and white model, for example, and break it down into parts that are most stressed or most damaged. Um, and in this, this wizard had been added sometime in around version nine. And so it's an easy way to set up filter runs. So I'll go through the screenshots and then I'll show you um, how this works in the software. So basically you, you go to your analysis glyph, you tell it that you wanna add a filter run. The first thing it asks you is do you wanna do a damage-based filter or a stress-based filter? So you choose that. Um, and you get to the wizard by right click on inside advanced edit of any glyph um, and choose auto elimination setup. So you choose whether you wanna do a stress and or damage-based calculation. So you could say, I wanna filter out my model and identify all the, the, the top 100 nodes that have the highest stress. And then out of those 100 high stress nodes, I wanna do a detailed fatigue calculation on the top 10 most damaged. Okay, so, so once you choose that, then it prompts you to pick how you wanna pass nodes or elements to, this, to the final fatigue calculation and that is either as a percent of the model or just a fixed number of calculation points. So for example, the top 500 elements. Um, and then what it does is basically build this filter run. And results are always kept only from um, the last run. So you're not, um, you know, there's no confusion of what's being written out. Um, Design life inside the glyph manages the output of the result pretty well. All right, so before I move on, I'm just gonna exit here and jump into the software real quick. So I have here um, basically a rotating shaft model that has been solved in, um, in Nastran. And so it's basically constrained completely on one side. And on the other end, I'm just applying a bending load and a torque load. So I have basically two subcases of stress and I can plot them here inside the FE input glyph. So this is basically the stress from, and the reason why it kind of looks like a, a measles plot is just because I have a solid mesh and a shell mesh on top of it. So what I can also do, so this is a mini tip inside a tip, is that I can also um, turn off the groups that I don't want to analyze. So if you have a bunch of parts or assemblies that you, you don't really care about um, doing a fatigue analysis on, you can go in here and turn them off and they won't be carried over into the calculation. So these are my stresses from the bending load. And then I also have um, stresses from the torsion load. And these are just linear static stresses. And with those, I have time history, which are basically my force as a function of time and moment as a function of time. So I've set this up to basically run the calculation on the whole model. So you can see that it runs pretty fast. It's a pretty small model. 6,000 elements, and we can identify from the contour plot where our damage hotspots are gonna be. So this, since this is a very small model, this is you know, very straightforward, but if you had uh, you know, a, a much larger model, a million nodes or two million nodes, this starts to get a bit cumbersome in terms of runtime and, and. So 
If I go into advanced edit on, on my analysis clip and go down here, right click on analysis definition and choose auto elimination setup, that brings up this wizard that prompts me if I want to do a damage or stress based filter. I'm just going to do damage for now. The next thing it asks me is, is basically how do you want to filter your time histories to identify those most damaged nodes? Um, you could, and this is basically how you're filtering your, your time history data in order to, so this is not the final damage calculation, but just how you identify um, the, the nodes or elements you want to keep for the second run. So I'm going to leave that default. And then in the last dialog box, it prompts you to specify how you want to pass elements to, um, to the final fatigue calculation. So here I'm going to say I want to find the top 500 elements um, on which I want to do, for example, a critical plane calculation. So I could set up my filter run here to do something simple like a principal stress calculation, identify the top 500 elements that have the most damage, and then go down here and for those 500 elements, do a detailed critical plane calculation. Okay, so I'm just going to rerun this, and now you'll see that it goes through the first run, and then it runs just the filter in the first run, and then the second run is basically going to be the critical plane calculation. And when this comes up, you'll see that it's it's a much more refined um, and more detailed calculation of the peak noise hours. Okay, I'm going to switch back. PowerPoint here. So I talked about how um, you can use auto elimination with the stress mode and damage mode. With version 10, there's an additional mode for hotspots. So rather than a percent model or a fixed number of calculation points, you can actually pass and identify and pass hotspots, stress or damage hotspots, um, to the final fatigue calculation. And that list can also be exported to a multi-column format, so a CSV file or, or a text file um, that you can then use as uh, a user group. So you can bring in that group of hotspots and then um, do further analysis with it. All right, so this is just reiterating what Paul talked about this, um, this morning um, about new material data sets in 10. So in version 10, there's a whole bunch of new material curves for strain life and stress life. And you will see that in the material database, uh, in the material mapper, um, in any of your analysis clips. And you could also organize that material data into different folders based on classes, um, for example, steel, aluminum, et cetera. Um, I think that's it.